My name is Steve Smith, and in this Plural Site On Demand video, we'll be discussing the Liskov Substitution Principle, one of the software fundamentals and the L in the solid principles of object-oriented development. In this brief course, we're going to define what the Liskov Substitution Principle means. We'll identify the problem that it intends to solve. We'll show some examples of how violations of this principle can become problematic in your code. And then we'll refactor this problem so that we are able to apply this principle and eliminate these problems. Finally, we'll look at some related fundamentals and additional resources. Let's get started. The Liskov substitution principle simply states that subtypes must be substitutable for their base types. This principle is named for Barbara Liskov, who first described the principle in 1988. This motivational poster sort of drives home the idea that if you have an abstraction that looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, but needs batteries, it's probably not the right one. So in this case, you could say that the rubber ducky that requires batteries is a duck, but it certainly isn't substitutable in all places where you'd expect to have an actual duck. In order for substitutability to work, the child classes must not remove behavior from their base class, nor should they violate base class invariance. In general, calling code should not know that there is any difference at all between a derived type and its base type. One of the things that many software developers learn early on in their education when they learn about object-oriented development is the use of the isa relationship to describe inheritance. It's very common to say that a particular class is a whatever base class it is. For example, one might have a employee class that is a contact, that is a person, or you might have a square that is a shape, or a car that is a vehicle. These, this is a very common tool, and what the Liskov substitution principle suggests is that rather than simply considering whether or not some, some noun is another noun, you should instead consider whether or not it is substitutable for that other noun in all situations where one might expect it to be. This is most easily seen through the use of an example, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, one of the things that is important when we talk about the Liskov substitution principle is this concept of invariance. Invariants are things that happen to be, have to do with the integrity of your model that your classes represent. So they consist of reasonable assumptions of behavior by clients, by other classes that make use of your class. These can often be expressed as preconditions and postconditions for methods, and they're not necessarily uh, in indicated within your code. Frequently, unit tests can be used to identify what the expected behavior is for a given method or class, and these unit tests should fail if that behavior is broken or changed by a subtype uh, that violates it. There's a practice called design by contract, which is a technique that makes defining these pre and post conditions explicit within the code itself. And there are a number of ways that you can use design by contract with C sharp, but those are beyond the scope of this particular session. In order to follow the Liskov substitution principle, derive classes must not violate any of the constraints defined or assumed by clients of their base classes. Let's look at an example of how Liskov substitution principle violations can cause problems using some simple geometric shapes. This demo uses two simple shape related classes. The, at the top of the screen you see we have a rectangle class which defines a height and a width and then we've derived square from rectangle because of course a square is a rectangle and we are taking advantage of uh, inheritance here to override these virtual properties and instead replace them with our own properties such that whenever we set the width it will set both the width and the height and likewise if we are to set the height the setter will set both the width and the height there as well. We've also defined an area calculator 
And area calculator knows how to calculate the area for a rectangle or for a square. And in this case, the two are, are very similar, of course. And so we've also written a few unit tests. And so our first unit test simply says that our calculate area method should return six if we give it a two by three rectangle. And so we set up our test with a two by three rectangle, call area calculator. Um, let's run this one, see if it works and it passes. Likewise, we expect that we can return nine from calculate area given a square with a height of three. And again, if we run this test, you can see nine for three by three square passed. But then we come to this third test. And this third test suggests that if I have a rectangle and I give it a width and a height of four and five, I should expect an area of 20. Um, in this case, we happen to get this rectangle from an instance of square, but that shouldn't have any bearing on our use of a rectangle from that point forward. So the problem that we're going to see in a moment is that this square type that we're using is not in fact substitutable for a rectangle where we would expect this invariant to hold true. So if we run this test, we will not surprisingly see that our assertion failed and that where we expected 20, we actually got a 25. So the problem here is clearly that our square, although in geometry a square is a rectangle, it is violating the behavior of a rectangle which simply states that when one sets the height and width of an actual rectangle, these should not have any effect on one another. It should be possible to set the height independent of the width and vice versa. Our implementation of this square class has broken that expectation of, of clients. So this is a reasonable expectation for the behavior of a rectangle. There's another problem with this design that we should look at. If we take a look at the area calculator class, it's violating a principle called tell don't ask. In this case, what's going on is it's asking its uh, parameter, the rectangle, for its height and its width, and it's performing some algorithm on it, in this case, simply multiplication. Likewise, it's asking a square for its height so that it can square the height. The problem with this is that we've got behavior now decoupled from state. The state of the rectangle, its height and its width, is being contained within the rectangle class, and the behavior of the rectangle, its area calculation, has been moved to this area calculator. Now, you might think that the single responsibility principle states that a rectangle shouldn't need to know about how to calculate its area, but it's also perfectly valid to argue that our rectangle lacks cohesion because operations that are wholly dependent upon rectangle, for instance, calculating its area, have now been moved out into this separate class, which can't exist on its own. This class only works if it's able to collaborate with a rectangle. So in this case, it might be worth considering a design change that pushed the responsibility for calculating area into the rectangle class or the square class as appropriate. Now there are several ways one could do this, and it's typically you would expect that you would put that kind of logic for calculating area into some kind of a base class because it's common to many different types of geometric shapes. But let's consider if we don't do that. If we take our simple rectangle and we have an abstract class shape that it's going to derive from, but our abstract class does not in fact define an area method, then we can push an area method onto rectangle that produces a height and a width. We can also define a square that inherits from shape and return its area using this side length property that we've defined. And then we can write our tests such that they work correctly. And these are the same three tests that we had before for the most part. So we've got a two by three rectangle where we're now calling its area method. We've got a three by three square calling its area method. And then finally we have uh, this last test that is actually gonna calculate 20 um, from rectangle and nine for three by three square. And let's just run them to prove that they are working currently. And you can see that they are. But let's look at how we implemented this because this is actually not something that we want to be doing. 
First of all, I created a list of shapes so that we could polymorphically uh, enumerate over a set of shapes and then do something with each one in a way that didn't care about the particular type of shape that it was. Likewise, I created a, a list of areas just so I have something to check when I'm done with my assertions. So I'm going to check what the first area calculated was and expect it to be 20. And I'm going to check the second area and expect it to be 9. And that's because I've passed in a 4x5 rectangle as my first item and a square with a length of 3 as my second item. Now in order to achieve this, I had to uh, investigate what the type was of each one of the shapes in my list. So when I enumerate through my collection using this for each loop, I can then go in and say, well, if my shape is of type rectangle, then call rectangles shape area method. And if it's of type square, then in that case, call the square area method. And I'm having to do a direct cast here. So you see that this works, but it's not maintainable. The next time I add another shape and I come down here and I say, okay, let's add a new uh, you know, public class triangle of shape and we give it something like a public int base and a public int height and we can say public int area return 0.5 times base times height of course, this stops working with ints, um, but you get the idea. At this point now, in order to get my method here to continue to work with any type of shape, I would have to go in and add triangle to this if check. And you can imagine that as I implement multiple different shapes, this would continue to get out of hand. So this is causing an open closed principle violation because my code here in this for each loop is no longer closed to modification. I'm going to have to open it up and edit this if statement block for every new type of shape that I define. And I'm going to have to do that in every location in my code that has to rely on this kind of behavior. So it's going to end up causing maintenance issues in the future. So we see that the problem with these Liskov substitution and principle violations is that the non-substitutable code breaks polymorphism. The code can no longer be used as if it were its base type. Also, client code should expect for these child classes to work in place of their base classes, and they no longer can do so. And finally, we saw that fixing substitutability problems can be done by adding if then or switch statements, but this can quickly become a maintenance nightmare as it violates the open closed principle. Here are a few of the smells that you should look for in your code that could be indicators of a Liskov substitution principle violation. In this case, we've got something similar to the uh, example we just showed where we're iterating over a collection of a particular base type, in this case, employee, and now we're going to test to see if that employee is a manager. And if that's the case, we'll go ahead and call print manager. Otherwise, we'll call print employee. You can imagine that as we added additional classes of employees, we might have to further break up this if statement and add additional cases to it, thus making our code more and more difficult to maintain. It would be better if the manager knew how to print itself or if the print manager were able to do the work within a single print method, uh, regardless of which type the employee was, so that this if logic could be removed. Another smell that you'll find is if you have a child type that inherits from a base class or interface, but does not fully implement that interface. So in this case, we have an abstract base class called base, which has methods one and two, and then we have this class child that's decided that it really only wants to implement method two, and it's going to leave method one throwing an exception. This kind of thing is fairly common. It can cause issues if clients of your code are expecting you to have fully implemented the interface, um, and in fact, you've only implemented it partially. If you control all of the code yourself, this may not be an issue in your case, but it is something to keep an eye on and, and be aware of. And it's something also that you might consider adding a unit test for just to prove 
that you do in fact expect this not implemented exception so that a user of your uh, interface will, or your actual implementation will know that that's expected behavior. Another thing that can help fix this kind of issue is if you follow the interface segregation principle, which we'll cover in a later episode. Uh, the interface segregation principle suggests that you use smaller, well-factored interfaces that are suited to the client code rather than larger interfaces than necessary. And so if this were the case where, in fact, you only needed method two of this base class, you could refactor that base class so that it only gave you the methods that you needed and specify an interface, um, either a base class or an actual C-sharp interface type that would only include the methods and fields that you require. Let's look at how we can refactor our shape example in order to achieve a better design. Recall that in our first design, we were unable to calculate the area of a rectangle correctly because when we passed it a rectangle that was actually a square, it treated the object as if it were a square and set both the, uh, both the sides to the same value. Then we considered the lack of inheritance version where we created a new class called shape that square and rectangle both derive from. So we broke the is a relationship between square and rectangle and replaced it with one that said that both a rectangle and a square are a shape. However, in this case, we didn't take it quite far enough because we didn't move the behavior of area into that abstract class and therefore we weren't able to use it polymorphically but instead we had this this nasty smell here where we have to check the type of each one and then call its particular area method. We can fix both of these problems by applying a little bit of intelligence to our design and simply creating that abstract area method on shape. Now that we have that method we can implement it via override on both uh, rectangle and square. And then we were able to run those same tests that we saw before. Uh, here we have one where we take a shape from a rectangle and we expect to get back 20. And in this case we do. And then likewise, if we take a list of shapes and we deal with it polymorphically by enumerating through it, our code is much simpler now. There's no if-then logic here at all we are simply adding up each shape's area and we're not asking each shape for its height and its width or its side length or whatever by some third party calculating code. Instead, we just are delegating to that shape and say, calculate your area, let me know what it is. If we run this, we will also see that it's now working. So by applying the refactoring such that we take rectangle and square and break them apart so that square no longer is a rectangle since they are not substitutable for one another and then moving that behavior into shape such that we can access it polymorphically on each object itself we're able to get a design that now follows the Liskov substitution principle and also is going to follow the open close principle because we'll be able to add additional shapes and add them to this collection and not have to touch this code that calculates the area of multiple shapes. So when should you take the time to look for and fix Liskov substitution principle violations? If you notice obvious smells like the one I just showed, either where you're doing if-then checks within a, a polymorphic en enumeration of uh, a collection of types, or where you're inheriting from a type or an interface and not fully implementing it. In either one of those cases, you may want to consider fixing that violation by using a better interface or simply fully implementing it or refactoring your code such that a different base class is used that does in fact offer substitutability. Otherwise, you can use the same rules as for the open close principle, which is that if you find yourself having to change the code more than once or two times, then it's time to refactor it such that it satisfies open close principle and also therefore the Liskov substitution principle. A couple of last tips. Um, remember, tell, don't ask. Uh, 
You should prefer not to interrogate objects about their internal state. Rather, if you find yourself doing that, it's a good idea usually to move that behavior into the object in question, or possibly extract out an object that has the state and the behavior collected together. Rather than asking, you know, let me know this property, let me know that property, let me know the other property, because I want to do some operation on them, you should just tell the object, run this operation, and it should use its own internal state to do so. You should also consider the refactoring to a new base class when you have two types that seem related, but you are not able to substitute them one for another as we saw with the square and the rectangle. In that case, you can create a third class that does in fact allow each of them to be substituted and move um, both of the base classes such that they derive from this new base class. To summarize, conformance to the Liskov substitution principle allows you to properly use polymorphism in your application and will produce more maintainable code. You should remember that is substitutable for is the preferred uh, relationship that you should be looking at when you consider inheritance rather than simply the is a relationship that's so commonly used. Some of the related principles to the Liskov substitution principle include polymorphism and inheritance, of course as well as two other solid principles, the interface segregation principle and the open-close principle. For more reading on this subject, I recommend the Agile Principles, Patterns, and Practices in C Sharp book by Robert C. Martin and Micah Martin, which you can get at the URL shown on your screen. And I need to offer some credits for the uh, image of the ducks that I showed. And then I would need to thank you for your time, and I hope that you'll return back to Pluralsight On Demand to learn more about software fundamentals in the near future. Thank you very much.